Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our special session this evening, Surviving the 2020 Election. I'm Peggy O'Neill, the Adult Services Publicity Librarian at Penfield Public Library. And we're planning, um, we wanted to plan this program. We had a, some of you might have been present in October when we had uh, preparing for the presidential election with both of our professors. And so this evening, they both returned Professor Sebastian Lazardo, who is the chair of the political science department at St. John Fisher College, and Professor Katie Donovan, who was formerly at St. John Fisher and is now the support specialist with the nonpartisan redistricting data hub in Rochester. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to them, but I just had a couple housekeeping things. We'll keep you muted for, um, we have a small group, so we probably can unmute later if you have questions. And if you did want to put anything into the chat, you're welcome to do that. And we also are recording this program in the event that there's someone you know who missed it and would like to um, get it again, we'll let you know. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Sebastian and Katie. Yeah, thanks, Peggy. Um, thanks. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, as, uh, as Peggy said, I work at the Redistricting Data Hub, which is a nonpartisan organization. So I just like to emphasize up front that uh, obviously my analysis and my opinions here are my own. Um, I've always strived to be nonpartisan uh, and as objective as possible um, when I do these kinds of talks anyway. So I don't think that actually affects really how I um, will engage uh, with you all tonight, but just wanted to say that up front. Um, and also, I think our plan of attack for this evening, uh, we'll see how it goes. I feel rusty. Um, I feel like normally I, you know, I get to talk with the students about all these things and that really helps solidify my thinking um, and sort of identifying what's important and all those kinds of things. And, and now I don't have that. Um, so we'll see, we'll see if that matters. Um, but, but our plan of attack for this evening is, um, is basically the two of us uh, would like to talk, uh, we'd like to actually address what we put in the description many months ago. We don't always do that. Sometimes we put together a description for the talk and then we just talk about whatever we want to talk about. But um, I think this time we're actually going to sort of go through um, and, and do that. Um, and I'm going to start off uh, doing most of the talking, um, covering some aspects of, of polling and media and, um, and Sebastian will jump in uh, when, when desired. Um, and then uh, towards the end, he'll be taking the lead a bit more um, and so specifically what we had said we would talk about was uh, what did political scientists and pundits get right and what did they get wrong? Uh, how is this election similar to previous elections and how is it uh, very different? Uh, and what are the implications for our democratic system of governance moving forward? So all easy questions, I think. Uh, so with that, I'll start off with the question of just sort of, you know, what, what did folks get right and what did folks get wrong? And I'll be transparent and say that um, I have the same items for, for both of those questions. Um, uh, talking, you know, specifically about polling and, and media coverage. So one of the things that I think that the media did a lot better with this time around, particularly compared to 2016, is taking the polling data and the other bits of information that we rely on in order to make predictions about elections and being more cautious about how certain we were in the outcome. In fact, I think you could even argue that they sort of over calibrated um, because going into election day, it looked pretty good for Biden. Um, in fact, it looked better for Biden in 2020 than it did for Clinton in 2016. And yet you saw them uh, being much more hesitant uh, about who, you know, making predictions about who was going to win, um, despite the fact that the, the polls, in particular the state polls, would have been, had to have been even more off, as I said, than they were in 2016. But, so I think they, they learned some lessons there, uh, sort of infamously in 2016, the New York Times upshot had Hillary Clinton, you know, they have like this little meter, this probability meter, and it was at 99%, right? And I don't think we'll, <laughs> you know, I don't know what they've, that they've done to their models, but uh, I would be very surprised unless it's, it's again, like clear it's going to be a landslide. And it was never clear that it was going to be a landslide in 2016, even though it seemed very likely that Clinton would win. Um, and same with 2020. 
so I, I do think that they learned some lessons in that regard, uh, which is nice. And I also think that part of that relates to an increased effort to try to reach out to quote unquote middle America. It is certainly true for national media organizations that they're based on the coast, uh, right? They're in New York City, they're in Washington, DC, they're in LA. Um, I mean, that's why when a snowstorm hits New York City, it's national news, uh, but you can have tornadoes ripping through you know, the Southeast and uh, it barely makes a dent. So there is definitely this sort of like city urban focus of a lot of journalists. And I think again, based on 2016, that they made a lot of efforts to go out and talk in particular to Trump supporters um, and, and trying to understand, you know, how strong was his base of support, which was, you know, again, if we looked at presidential approval, he was pretty much stuck at 40% his whole, his whole tenure. I mean, it went up maybe to as high as 45 and as low as 38 kind of thing, but, but it was pretty much right around 40. And so when only 40% of the public approves of the sitting president, it's like, well, how, what's his pathway to win? Okay. Um, and, and people thought last time that he wouldn't win and he did. So let's make sure that we're talking to these folks, um, and not missing people, right. Not, not ignoring people and sort of saying, ah, you know, this will never happen or like, you know, they won't actually vote kind of thing. Um, so that's the best I can do for the media. Some small lessons learned. That's very nice. Uh, in terms of polling, um, that's a really mixed bag. So it depends on what website you look at. Um, I tend to look at 538 as well as uh, realclearpolitics.com, um, which does some nice polling averages. And uh, Biden was up in polls, in, in the national polls, on average by like eight points. Uh, we'll say again, it's going to vary depending on what's, what site you're looking at and what aggregation of the polls you're looking at. And he ended up winning by a little over four points. Um, so, you know, that's a four point margin of error uh, for the national polls, um, which is not, you know, obviously smaller is always better, but it's not horrific. It's not great, right? There's room for improvement, um, but but not too, too shabby. Um, so, and just to give you some context for this, um, 538 has also gone back and looked at how the polls have performed nationally in the last several presidential election cycles. Uh, and for example, in 2012, Obama was underestimated by four points. Um, in 2000, Gore was underestimated by five points. Um, and in 1980, Reagan was underestimated by eight points. Now, granted, the polling um, improved a little bit since 1980. So I think some of that's the polling methodology. Um, but, I, but I point these out to say, like, number one, it's not that the polls are consistently overestimating Republican or excuse me, Democratic support. It changes from, from year to year. Um, it just so happens that the last two cycles um, they've overestimated Democratic support, but we only have to go back to Obama's second term to see them underestimating Democratic support. Um, but I should also say, too, that I'm cherry picking numbers here, right? So like on average, if you look at the last, you know, 30 years of presidential elections, the average polling miss is about 2.3 points. So yes, uh, in 2020, we were sort of above, above the average. Um, and, and I guess the last point I'll make about this, too, is that we care a lot more about the difference between the predictions, the polls, and the outcome when the difference is in the wrong direction. So for example, in 2020, we predicted Biden would win, and he did. So people don't get so ups as upset about that as when we predict, for example, that Clinton wins, and then she doesn't, right? So even though the polling miss could have been theoretically smaller, in fact, I think it was actually in 2016 at the national level, um, you know, People, people really freaked out about it. Whereas if you if you guess it right, who's going to win? You could still have a big miss, and people don't don't get so upset. Um, in terms of the state presidential polls, which again, if you remember in 2016, this was this was a core part of the problem uh, that the state polls were off, uh, particularly in the Rust Belt, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, and they were all off in the same direction, um, meaning that they were all underestimating Trump support. Um, and that tends to happen that if you have a if you have a polling miss, they're going to be correlated so that, you know, if you're underestimating a candidate support, you're probably underestimating that candidate support in other places. Um, 
This year, there were some really good wins for the state polls at the presidential level. Pennsylvania was spot on. Uh, Arizona was spot on. North Carolina, Georgia, they were all basically within one point. Um, so those are, and especially Georgia, right? Like Georgia was the new, real nail biter. People, people are looking at Georgia and going like, mm, I don't know. Uh, and, sh and sure enough, I, full disclosure, my father and my sister live in Georgia and my best friend lives in Georgia. So I was getting a lot of Georgia information uh, during the election. And uh, they were all like, can you believe it? He might win the state. And I'm like, I don't know, it's pretty close. And uh, yeah, and turns out the polls were spot on in, in Georgia. Um, and then a lot of the Senate polls were also pretty good in terms of predicting the Senate elections, um, again, including Georgia. Uh, so there were some really good polls this cycle. Um, that being said, what did they get wrong? Uh, lots of other places. Uh, Maine, for example, was way off. Uh, I don't think a, or hardly any poll showed Susan Collins with any sort of lead. It was either tied or... Um, Gosh, what was her competitor's name? Sarah Gideon? I think so. Gideon? Yeah. Uh, you know, pretty much all the polls were showing Sarah Gideon with the, in the lead or it being a very close lace. Uh, and she ends up winning by several points, um, by almost nine points. So that was a that was certainly a big miss. Um, and after I just touted a lot of the state presidential polls, I will also say there were some misses there as well. Um, Florida. Uh, was off by about four points. And they were, again, all in the direction of underestimating Trump support, right? So Florida underestimated Trump support. Wisconsin underestimated Trump support by six points. Uh, Ohio by seven points. Uh, Iowa underestimated Trump by six points. Texas underestimated Trump by four and a half points. Um, and uh, so that's certainly uh, an something that we can talk more about, about what, what's going on there. Um, but I would also say too, uh, the House, um, that generally speaking, when you looked at people who are predicting the outcome in the House, uh, the general consensus was that the Democrats, you know, would, would probably pick up a few seats. Um, and instead they flipped three and the Republicans flipped uh, 16, I guess it was, or 15. Um, and so overall, the Republicans picked up a net 12 seats. Um, so, so the Democrats are still in the majority, as you all are certainly aware, um, but a, a narrower majority than they were previously. Um, and what's interesting about that, and I can't take credit for this realization, it was I actually sat in on a webinar uh, talking with some experts about polling and things like that. And one of the guys there made the point that, uh, you know, it's happened before that a candidate, a presidential candidate has lost, but the House picked up some seats. Um, in fact, that's exactly what happened in 2016. But, and I haven't taken the time to, to research this and confirm this, uh, but I'm, I can't think of anybody, um, and none of the experts in this webinar could either, but that a time that a, a incumbent president lost, but picked up seats. Right. So normally when a president wins, they have coattails and bring in uh, people with them. Right. So you're voting for the president. Uh, people show up for the presidential election that don't normally vote. And then they go down ballot and they're like, yeah, sure, I'll vote for the, the guy in the same party kind of thing. Uh, and so you pick up some seats that way. But this time around, it seemed like people definitely thought about Trump differently from the Republican Party. Right. Um, and so you actually had folks voting for their uh, House member, Republican, but not necessarily for Trump. So I'll pause and just say I've been talking a lot already. Sebastian, do you want to jump in on anything? Mm -hmm. that I've been saying? Uh, yeah, just uh, the, the, the last part uh, that you were mentioning, the, uh, this, you know, ticket splitting in a way where, where people would vote for uh, for the democratic candidate for the presidential election and uh and for the republican candidate for uh for the house uh this is something that i think speaks uh, a lot about the the very divisive nature of, of donald trump and and how uh, a, a lot of people consider themselves more conservative and more republican or uh were in a position where 
they really had issues with voting for uh, for Donald Trump as president. And, and it, it's something that is not really, when you, you think back at 2016, we often forget, but uh, in 2016, Trump was not the, really the favorite Republican candidate at all. Uh, in fact, when uh, I, I remember polling, and I, I tell that to my students, where you, you were left with the four last candidates uh, in the primaries, uh, Trump, Kissed, uh, uh, Rubio, and Cruz, uh, when you were asking people, would you rather vote for either one of the other three or Donald Trump, they would all in a majority say we want the other person and not Trump. Uh, and it's just a matter of fact that Trump was the one to receive the nomination and, and, and be candidate. So, so it's something that you know was already an issue within the, the Republican Party and something that really was expressed even more during the election. Um, yeah, and I'll just say too, uh, so one more thing in terms of the bucket of things that I think went wrong. So like I said, I, I think media, the media learned some lessons, but not some others. Um, you know, so, so Sebastian was just saying about how Trump was not the favored candidate in the Republican Party. And that's very clear. Uh, one of the ways that we look at that is, is endorsements um, called the invisible primary. And, and generally speaking, the person who receives the most endorsements or, you know, a plurality of endorsements or what have you, uh, goes on to be the nominee. Um, and in this case, right, I mean, Trump had no real strong ties to any of the major players in the Republican Party. He was, a, he was an outsider. And frankly, that was something that voters really liked about him. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so when you try to figure out, like, how does a guy win? the nomination for president from a major political party with little to no internal party support, <laughs> um, one of the major factors was just the insane amount of media coverage that he received. Mm -hmm. Because love him or hate him, you were gonna read the article. You had to know, what well, what did he say? What did he do now, okay? Um, and, and we're all guilty. We were all guilty of that. Again, like no matter what side you were on. And uh, media coverage is a predictor of winning. Um, it's, it's very difficult to know what causes what, because it's sort of like polling and making money, fundraising and being in the media all predict winning, but they're all also related to each other, right? If you're like up in the polls, then people want to donate to your campaign and then you get more media coverage. And so it's, it's all very, very connected there. Um, and so he received this, he didn't need money, right? He was personally wealthy, um, but and did, fine and fi fundraising anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, so so when you look at just how much he was covered in the media, it, it's we call it free media as opposed to paid media placing advertisements, um, which most Americans uh, dislike intensely. Um, he got just tons and tons of free media coverage uh, that really helped him. Um, and so, so it seems pretty clear that that was a, a major contributing factor um, I don't know that the press learned that lesson. They certainly talked about it a lot. They recognized that they played a role uh, in promoting him and in getting people to talk about him. Um, and it's harder when obviously he's an incumbent president, right? Um, you, you have to, to cover him. But this was actually an ongoing conversation his entire presidency was just sort of like, you know, when he, for example, like proposes something that's just clearly unconstitutional, like that's not going to go anywhere, right? That's, that's, that's not a workable idea. Like, how do you cover that from a media perspective? Um, so I think they had a lot of conversations about it, but I don't know that they really learned their lessons. And I'm not sure that if we had another candidate like him, uh, that sort of, you know, really made a splash and just really was something that people wanted, you know, was like really attracted to. I mean, we have a we have a privatized media system for the most part. And so they're going to produce media that gets the most clicks and gets the most eyeballs. And so whatever we ask for, we will receive. And so so it's I mean, it's not just the media's fault. It's it's also um, ours as well for sort of being like, ah, what is Kim Kardashian and Kanye up to now? You know, like that kind of thing. But um, 
I, I think that that is something that they are aware of, but haven't necessarily addressed. And I think something else that really struck me around the media coverage was, you know, now that we're sort of heading to the end of the pandemic, um, it looks like, fingers crossed, um, you know, maybe it's it's hard to remember, but but in 20, you know, in the lead up to 2020, uh, this was sort of like the second wave, or I think Fauci actually just said, this is still the first wave, you know. Uh, but the fall was a really tough time for people and dealing with COVID. And yet when you look, and actually I'm including here a link, um, I can also share my screen if that would be easier for folks, but um, that is a link to one of the exit polls. Uh, we actually had two sets of exit polls this cycle. Normally there's just one. Normally all the media organizations pool together, the major media organizations pool together and do exit polls. Um, this year, the AP and Fox News um, basically splintered off and decided to uh, conduct exit polls uh, separately um, from all the rest. Um, but uh, if so, so if you look at those exit polls and they will be a little bit different if you look at the other set of them. Um, and in particular, if you scroll uh, all the way down to issues, uh, the most important issue facing the country, which for me is like, you know, a third of the way down on my, my scroll bar. Um, the coronavirus pandemic was the most commonly picked issue, right? In terms of what's the most important issue fishing, fixing this country, facing this country, that was 41%. But then you had 28% of voters who said the economy and jobs. Um, and those voters went overwhelmingly for Trump. Uh, whereas folks who identified uh, COVID as their number one issue overwhelmingly went for Biden, not as overwhelmingly as those who picked economy and jobs. But and, you know, I was hearing a lot in the media just talking about the pandemic and, you know, Trump, you may recall, contracted the coronavirus uh, during the, the series of debates. Um, and and so it was kind of like, oh, you know, this is the most important thing. He's mishandled it. Right, all these people have died. Uh, he can't possibly win when coronavirus is the number one issue for people, right? And it turns out, yeah, it was the number one issue for some people, but lots of other people it was not, <laughs> right? Uh, in fact, you could say the majority of people did not pick the coronavirus as their number one issue. They were picking the economy, they were picking healthcare, they were picking climate change, they were picking racism. Um, there were a lot of other issues out there. And so, I think that um, that was something the media fell down on uh, as well, a sort of sort of hyper focusing on this is the issue and this is what voters care about uh, when, in fact, lots of voters um, were thinking about other mm -hmm. other things. Um, no, that, that's a very good point. If I can add to this, and I, that may be something that I we mentioned in the previous talk, but uh, when, when you actually look at uh, the, the Trump presidency, there are a lot of things that, uh, and you look objectively, a lot of things that Republicans were looking for that were delivered. Uh, tax reform, uh, conservative justices on the bench, uh, an economy that was actually doing uh, pretty well before COVID, uh, and, and, and the signs that were of a strong economy, uh, a different type of uh, foreign relations perspective where uh, the U.S. tended to flex its muscle against China a little more. Um, all these things that were actually things that the Republican base wanted. So, so for all the people for whom the the pandemic was not the dominant issue, uh, and and not and more uh, more on the conservative side, there was no reason not to reward the the candidate with. Uh, uh, with their vote for that reason. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. Thanks for adding that, Sebastian. Sorry, the cat is very excited to join us this evening. Oh, okay. Nope. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> the fun of at home Zoom. Okay, no. Nope. Right. He likes the, <laughs> the spotlight. Yeah, she well, she likes girl talk. Anytime I'm talking with people, she's like, hey. <laughs> Um, it's like politics. <laughs> yeah. okay. she'll, she'll listen to anything. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's a really great point. And um, and I think uh, you know, you you listed off some really strong, strong issues. I mean, we didn't even talk about some of the, the foreign policy moves he made, which it's it's not an important foreign policy is not a top issue for many people, to be sure. 
Um, but certainly things like, uh, you know, some of his moves in Israel, right, being a very strong ally of Israel, um, there's a block of voters for whom that's important. So, um, yeah, thanks for... And, and the and the framing of the of the relationship with China as a uh, you know mm. that is framed with the um, you know make America great again and 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 trade wars and you know not not letting China uh, take over the United States as the dominant economic power in the world that's that that was really what it was about so if you made it you frame it strictly in terms of foreign policy issue and what should the U.S. China relationship be like, and nobody cares about this. I mean, most voters really don't care about about this issue. But if you frame it as a you know a, a competition over who is the strongest, what country is the strongest economy in the world, then then that that is much more impactful for voters. Um, so that's something to to consider as well. Mm -hmm. So next, we would like to just talk a little bit about how this election was similar with previous elections and, and how it was different. Um, so in some respects, uh, this election was fairly predictable. Um, you know, first and foremost, partisanship is still uh, an increasingly powerful predictor of vote choice and behavior. Um, you know, Biden won 94% of self-identified Democrats. Trump won 94% of self-identified Republicans. Um, now, what is always a bit frustrating to me, and I say this as someone who has co-authored a paper with, with uh, folks using time series data, um, but what I always get frustrated with when we talk about the parties over time is that obviously the people that are in the party change. Uh, and so if you were somebody like a John Kasich in 2016, who were just like, nope, right, you're, on, you're the never Trumpers, okay? Are you still an identified Republican in 2020? For example, Colin Powell uh, said he could no longer identify as a Republican. Um, I've seen some tidbits about registration numbers in terms of, of you know, dropping and, and changing. I mean, the number of independents in general has been on the rise for a long time. People are very dissatisfied with our two party system, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, so in a way, uh, it's it shouldn't be that surprising that that Trump would do so strongly among Republicans, even when, as we said, initially, he was not he was far from the preferred nominee uh, of the Republican Party in 2016. Um, and some of that is is just the power of partisanship uh, when, you know, even if you're reluctant about the nominee, at the end of the day, this guy is the head of your party and you want to support your team. Um, and that would be just as true of the Democrats as well. Right. Um, but also who is actually identifying as Republicans and Democrats changes over time. And so even though we can compare and say like, oh, X percent of Republicans voted for Trump in 2016 versus 2020, the group of people who are part of that party um, does change, uh, I think in important ways. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, partisanship is still really, really important. Uh, that's no surprise in our polarized era. Um, but if you think, if you, I think if you asked any of uh, Dr. Lazardew's students, right, who have just grown up in this era, right, they, they don't know a world where it's not like that, right? Like they've never, they've never experienced a situation in which people, you know, might identify as a Democrat, but be like, yeah, I like the Republicans, you know, I'm, I'm into that. I, I could see myself voting for that guy. It just doesn't, it does happen, but in a much, much smaller scale uh, than it used to. Um, number two, uh, money still buys votes. Uh, if you look, especially at the Senate and the House elections, and you look at who raised more money, uh, it was like 85% of the time the person that raised more money wins. Now, again, I just said like 10 minutes ago that all these things are related. Money is related to polling, is related to media coverage, is related, you know. So, you know, does money, when I say money buys votes, is it that direct? No. Um, but as a predictor of who is likely to win an election, 
it's still a pretty good one. It doesn't work as well at the presidential level just because those guys are raising just insane quantities of money and they also have really high name recognition. Um, but certainly at, at the House level, um, lower level elections, that is the case. Um, and sadly, I can say this, uh, that this is uh, similar to previous elections because of 2016. Uh, disinformation is still a very serious problem um, and will continue to be a very serious problem um, for a while. I don't know when we'll hit the uh, inflection point. I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. Uh, and so I say the same thing about polarization. It, it can't just continue to get worse forever. Uh, we're basically already at the floor and the ceiling anyway. Like <laughs> the parties can't dislike each, well, famous last words, right? They can't dislike each other any more than they already do. Uh, at some point, things will have to start going the other direction. The million dollar question is what is the catalyst for that event? Uh, Unfortunately, a common enemy is a good one, but I'm not advocating we go to war. I'm not, this is not a wag the dog situation here, but um, <laughs> maybe space aliens. I'm sure that if aliens showed up, I hear actually we're gonna get a huge UFO report because of the COVID relief bill passed last year. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has seen this, but you know, maybe. Maybe that'll bring us together as a country. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and this even started before the election, uh, you know, talking about vaccines. Um, there is a, a, a small but strong um, anti-vaccination crowd in this country. Um, and uh, they have grown more uh, with the pandemic. Um, this is of course not confined to the US. Um, this, this sort of mis and disinformation occurs pretty much anywhere there is internet and probably even places without internet. <laughs> it just travels slower by word of mouth. Um, but uh, that they uh, got a real boost um, this past year. Um, and then of course, <laughs> you know, um, the, the notion that the election was stolen, it was rigged. Um, this is actually very, very troubling um, for, for obvious reasons, uh, for just upholding our democracy. But, um, you know, when I, have the polls I've seen, um, and it is not confined to Republicans, there are independents and Democrats who also do think that the election was rigged. Uh, but by far the largest group uh, is among Republicans and it's anywhere from, you know, 50, I've seen as high as 70, but, but most of the polls I've seen are like half, basically half of Republicans um, believe that the election was rigged. And the irony of this, is that this was the most litigated, the most audited presidential election we've ever had. Uh, it was actually an excellent test of the system. Um, I'm actually appreciative of the fact that the Trump administration filed 61 lawsuits in state and federal courts alleging various things. 60 of these he lost. Uh, the one he did win, I believe, was in Pennsylvania um, relating to a, a, a sort of, I should have looked it up actually ahead of time. Um, if you, I'll, I'll try to find exactly what the, the win was in that particular case. But um, so that's great. Like, <laughs> I think it's great to actually test the system and say like, look, you know, we had recounts. We had uh, recounts in, in Georgia, for example. Um, and, and for me, the way that I interpret that is as an excellent confidence booster in, in the system. So they're like, yeah, okay, let's recount, let's audit, let's have a judge consider this. And time and time and again, uh, regardless of whether the judge was a Republican appointee judge or a Democratic appointee judge, uh, the outcome was almost always the same. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and yet this will persist. Uh, I do think, and I'd actually love to hear Sebastian's thoughts on this. I do think that that perception will decline over time. Um, and we've seen that happen in the past. Uh, the, my favorite example that I like to point to is uh, OJ, actually. Uh, was OJ guilty or not? Uh, and in the immediate aftermath of the verdict, blacks and whites had very, very different opinions on that. Um, but now, and they, they've actually done polls in the last like five, 10 years or whatever, um, 
the black community has slowly changed their opinion and now at about the same rate as whites say that he was he was guilty um and so i think with time that sometimes folks do come around uh to the reality which i guess in a court of law oj was innocent but let's get real um <laughs> but uh i i do think that nonetheless that the perception will persist among a subset of americans and uh what that turns into in the long term um may not be good um it may just simmer and nothing really happens about it and it's just something that people complain about and they say like ah the election was stolen but you know i'm i'm not gonna pick up a, a flagpole for example and head to the capitol um but uh you know i don't know I, I unfortunately <laughs> can't tell the future that well. Um, and I think it was very clear as it became very clear on January 6th that there there is a group of people who are willing to take action uh, based on these perceptions. Um, and, you know, to the extent that they continue to network with each other and uh, um, and think about this, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what will happen with that. Um, so, yeah, so I. Like I said, I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts, Sebastian. Uh, no, I, I I tend to agree with you, uh, and, and I'm actually probably more optimistic uh, than than other people about about this, uh, uh, because I, I think you're right to point out that it was a great thing that we had all these uh, uh, all these. Um, the contestation of the of the results of the elections in courts, all these court cases, uh, because it is supposed to be part of of the the political system, right? It's a it's a uh, it, it is how we are making sure that elections are free and fair. It is we have a judicial system that actually works and that showed that. Um, there, I don't think there's any way that you will ever convince somebody who truly believes that this election was stolen that it was not stolen. Uh, however, uh, in terms of the electoral process itself, uh, these, we have judicial safeguard against this, this potential abuse uh, and potential fraud in elections, uh, something that other countries do not have. Uh, with much weaker judicial system or uh, higher level of corruption. Uh, what is the, the problem with contesting the result of an election, saying that the, the election was a fraud, uh, to me was not about making that claim. It's what it says about what you believe about your political system in general. Uh, so um, when uh, the former president who still does say that the election is, was rigged. My problem with it is not so much, you know, the his statement is the fact that it says that he has no belief in the people who work during the elections, the, the, the state and the, the state electoral laws that are put in place, the safeguards through the judicial system that exists to prevent fraud, uh, all the, all the minutiae of, of the procedures of voting that uh, that exist to make sure that fraud is actually not an issue. That's, to me, that's, that's an expression of um, questioning really the, the democratic process itself and, and, the, and the institutions of, of the US. Uh, and and that, that's what I think is, is most troubling about this. Uh, concerning, um, so I, I think, you know, well, but, but I think the issue will, will disappear. I, because uh, I don't think that anybody else, uh, assuming that he's not candidate again in, in 2024, um, I don't think that anybody would go at such length to, to push that issue uh, in, in the future. So I'm, I tend to be a little more, a little more optimistic about this. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and, and here I'm going to may, maybe take a stand that is a little bit 
different from uh, from Katie about about partisanship. I you could very well make a claim that partisanship is a great thing. Uh, and uh, partisanship, especially heightened level of polarization between parties, uh, could be seen as something that is good, uh, and, and especially for voters, uh, voters who do not have a, a lot of understanding of the uh, of the issues, or who, who don't do not see clearly differences between one party and the other. Item polarization makes it much more visible and allows voters to make choices. Uh, it, it's let's put it that way: it's less costly for them to make a choice. There's less uncertainty. You know who you're voting for. You know that you know you're clearly if you're voting for somebody who is extremely conservative that the, the type of policies that you're going to get and, and same thing for somebody who's extremely liberal uh, and and so this the visibility in the, the in the the differences between candidates makes makes the election easier for most people so you could you know very well we talk well yes but shouldn't the the public be you know educated and and it doesn't give an incentive for the public to educate himself on the candidates and on the issues. Well, that's true, uh, but um, there's not much that we can do to incentivize people to get educated about politics. Uh, it's not something that we get to decide or something that we, you know, it's fine to tell people what well, you need to know about, you know, about the candidates for the election, what they stand for. Uh, how, what, how much uh, control do you have over whether people are going to do that or not? And the, the fact is that for most people, politics is, you know, something that they maybe get a little bit interested, you know, once every four years or, you know, uh, I was going to say one every two years, but that's not even true because midterm elections are not that, uh, that interesting for most of the public. Um, and so, so it's not really something that we can do much about. So I think that giving these voters who are not, for whom politics is not a major part of their life, contrary to people like me who are passionate about it and who have created a, you know, uh, a career out of it, uh, it's, I, I think it's, it's, it can be helpful. Um, so, so that's my, you know, my, uh, my feeble attempt at, at you know saying that partisanship is not automatically uh, that that bad. Uh, of course, uh, and I will make this caveat: it can be bad uh, in in some cases. But I think the issue is not really polarization. The issue is more about the institutional system. And we we've seen that in the past, and we continue to see that uh, with uh, what is happening in Congress right now. Uh, very, very difficult for the, the Democrats to pass their agenda. Uh, and it's not so much because, uh, at least uh, uh, the, the West, is not so much because the Congress is, is, because the parties are so polarized, but because we have rules, we have an institutional system that allows uh, to block legislation from uh, the minority standpoint. Uh, and that's you know, uh, and 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 other more complicated procedural rule in Congress that allow to delay votes and delay uh, uh, adoptions and, and even looking at bills. This is this is the rule. Right? I mean, the, you know, uh, I, I think uh, my my colleague Katie was talking earlier about. Uh, things like partisanship or even, uh, well, we can talk about turnout. Uh, these are, you know, <laughs> uh, these are things that are often guided by the rules that you have in place. Uh, uh, the, uh, the turnout this year was uh, extremely high. Uh, how much was it? 66%? So I, something that we, you know, it, it's, I mean, in the context of American politics, it's amazing, right? Uh, it, it's never seen before. And, and even President Trump said that he had, you know, 
so many you know, votes. Uh, yeah, they were highest in over twenty years. It's this said, you know, there, there must be a, a reason for it. So, so what what could be that reason? Why did we have such a high turnout? Uh, and it's very difficult for me not to think as the primary hypothesis the fact that you had two candidates who were uh, very obviously very different from each other, in particular the the incumbent president who uh, seemed you know at the same time attracted a lot of media attention uh, and made this this campaign interesting for for the electorate and people wanting to vote, but also for a large portion of the electorate, somebody that they could not see at all in office anymore. Uh, and so, so you go to the poll because you want this person out of office and you want to make sure that he's not going to win. Uh, and and the, the supporters of the former president on the other side know this and they again say, well, you know, we want our candidate to win. We cannot have, have Biden in power. And, and all these Democrats are going to go vote for him because, and, and even, you know, even thinking maybe unconsciously, you know, some moderates will not follow us. And so, so we have the risk of having our president leaving office and we cannot stand that. So we'll go to the vote. Um, it, is, it is about, you know, it, it's very really an effective way of, of seeing, uh, seeing politics, but something that matters a lot. Sixty-six mm percent. -hmm. Yeah, great job, America. You know. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually agree with with pretty much uh, everything you you said. Yeah, and um, like definitely partisanship is uh, super useful for people, um, <laughs> especially you know earlier we we're talking about foreign policy, but then we we're like, yeah, most Americans don't care about foreign policy. So if they have to figure yeah. out how do they think about foreign policy, do they like? Uh, having a, a trade war? Do they like an antagonistic posture towards China? Well, what does Trump say, right? Um, and again, same for the Democrats. Um, you know, folks, there's a lot of uh, evidence for, for what we call issue publics, um, where people sort of have one issue that they really care a lot about and they know things about, whether that's education or healthcare, or for some people it's abortion or guns, right? But it's a very, it's a high demand to expect voters to be educated on every single issue. Uh, and then to also know what the candidates stand on that issue. I mean, I would love it if we all met that high bar, but I do recognize it is a, it is a high bar. Um, and so certainly for, for reducing the complexity of information gathering and making choices and all that kind of stuff, partisanship super helpful. And I also say too, yeah, I mean, that was going to be the thing I, that I, the one thing we hadn't talked about yet in terms of how this election was different, um, the turnout, um, and we would be remiss if it if it if we didn't also mention uh, the vast expansion of voting access uh, that was was happening in most states, uh, not every state, but um, a lot a lot of places. You know were. Uh, for example, in New York, you could vote by absentee ballot and and say temporary illness as your excuse uh, with COVID, you know, being the, the temporary illness. Um, and, uh, you know, we we we're seeing the backlash from that, um, that there's uh, hundreds of bills uh, being introduced across the state uh, to restrict voting access in various ways. Um, and uh, you know, uh, we'll we'll see what happens there. But um, it was it was also yes. I mean, it was a, a an issue. It was an election that people thought was very very important. They felt very very strongly about the candidates for the most part. Um, and frankly, even though you know we said earlier that there's a lot there's a lot of independents, right? Uh, people who are dissatisfied with the two party system. At the end of the day, a lot of those independents also tend to lean one way or the other. And if you push them hard enough, they'll go, ah, yeah, okay, I usually vote for the, you know, this party or that party. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, identifying with a party and similarly identifying with an ideology, like saying, I'm a liberal or I'm a Republican, uh, that is a part of your identity in the same way that people identify as Jewish or identify as Hispanic. 
Um, and, and it's become an increasingly important part of people's identity um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, you know, so uh, there are a lot of people out there that just really like to identify as independent. Um, they like the idea, um, and I totally get that. Um, I, I relate to that of, of wanting to present yourself as someone who is open uh, to hearing both sides of an issue, uh, even though even simplifying it to two sides is, <laughs> is you're already missing some other perspectives there, but that you're open to, to hearing the different perspectives on a particular issue. You're open to thinking about the candidates and not just automatically saying I'm X and therefore I will vote for the candidates in X party. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of people do behave that way, right? In the same way that people who want to quit eating chocolate, you know, they might say, oh, I don't eat chocolate, but I still love chocolate, you know, like, and I still might eat chocolate occasionally when no one's looking. Um, it's sort of like that. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I'm going to use that one. <laughs> yeah. I guess chocolate is the, the parties in this analogy. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but, and I just wanted to say one more quick thing. Um, and then I think we should open it up for, for mm -hmm. questions and comments. Um, is that I would like to correct myself. It was actually 62 lawsuits, not 61. Mm -hmm. uh, 62 lawsuits, they lost 61. And the one that they did win was that uh, they, the judges ruled in Pennsylvania that voters could not go back and cure or basically fix their ballot if they failed to provide proper identification three days before the election. Um, so yeah, so with that, um, we'd love to hear your, your comments, your questions, um, yeah, anything. I don't see in the chat, I see a couple comments, but I don't think any more questions. People wanna unmute themselves too. And, yeah. Hi, I, I had a comment. Sure. Um, I have a family member that for a long time has been an independent and, um, and has voted either, you know, depending on the candidate that he liked. Um, but, you know, since, uh, since Trump's been in office, um, he actually changed his party affiliation to Democrat. Um, and he just decided he's never going to vote for another Republican again, um, based on, you know, the, the history of what happened um, in Trump's term and, you know, how how some of the very partial politics um, Republicans are behaving at this point in time. So I don't know how common you think that is and if that's going to influence things, you know, going forward, going in the future. That's a good question. I don't know if, uh, if Katie has uh, any like, idea of, uh, of how that would play out. Uh, to be honest, I, I always hesitate to make predictions about the future. I, I always say that, you know, there's one thing that political scientists are terrible at is predicting what's going to happen. Uh, uh, but uh, this said, uh, I think that uh, in the, the case of, uh, of the person you were, you were talking about, um, it, it is, you know, it is, I, I would say it is difficult for, for Republicans uh, because they are in a position where uh, they are in a no, uh, they are in a lose-lose situation, right? Uh, if you identify with the Republican Party, uh, you automatically identify with Donald Trump and the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to distance yourself from, uh, from the Republican Party by distancing, trying to distance yourself from the the Trump presidency, uh, you, uh, you're not considered as a Republican anymore. Uh, you are kind of shunned. Uh, and so that can happen, you know, at the, at the individual level, but that happens within the party. That's what is going on right now is that uh, it's very, very difficult for a lot of Republicans to uh, even be critical of Donald Trump uh, because they are afraid of losing votes from, from a core group of, uh, of people who are really uh, attached to him as a, as a person, really. Uh, he, is, he has, whether you like it or not, he has some kind of charisma that is difficult to explain. Uh, and so, 
So what do you do? Like, you know, you, uh, for some people, uh, becoming yeah, becoming an independent is is the right thing to do. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that they are uh, or, or leaving the Republican Party. It doesn't. You know, I don't think that over the long term it automatically means that they will never vote for a Republican again. Uh, uh, it, it just means that uh, they they really don't feel connected to a party that has. And, and we've seen that through, you know, the uh, measures of ideology, a party that has veered more and more conservative uh, and, and has given a lot of space for, uh, for the Democrats to, to take that space. Um, so I don't think that, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm terrible at making predictions, but I don't think that's when they say, I will never vote for a Republican again, that's more of a, uh, you know, something you say when you are really mad, you know, like mm -hmm. that, that's something. And in that case, they're mad at Trump because they see Donald Trump as, as taking the party in a direction that made them really uh, make it, made it very difficult for them to win elections in the future. So could I ask a question? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So, so you refer to independence, but isn't it true that the fastest growing demographic is really people registering as blanks, no political party? And doesn't that tell a little different story? And also, you know, when I talk to my friends that have decided to give up either the you know, Republican or Democratic party and they wanna be independent, not the independence party, they don't realize what they're doing to themselves by disqualifying themselves from being able to vote in the primary and the like. So I think there's a real knowledge gap for these people that are disenchanted and don't wanna be part of either the Republican or Democratic party, you know, wanna be somewhere else. They don't realize the consequences of, you know, switching the party or again, young people in droves are being registering as blanks. So I'll just leave it at there. Can you comment on that phenomena? Uh, yeah, so, so first of all, very important distinction that you made between the independence party <laughs> and being an independent. Uh, when we did voter registration drives, I had to always be like, just make sure you look them up, you know? Because uh, the independence party doesn't mean independent. Um, but yeah, so so when I uh, use the term independent, I, I do effectively mean blanks, like saying not I, I don't identify with one of the, the two major parties. And and usually, unfortunately, um, in polls, those are the three options people are given Republican, Democrat or independent. Um, and of course, we do have other parties in the United States. They they don't do well, uh, largely because of the rules we have in place. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so also like when you're when you're looking at identification in polls, it's partially driven by the, the choices that people were given as well. And so, you know, if, if these are your only choices, then that's the deal. Um, but I, I do, you know, I like, so I, I have a background in, in survey data and worked in a polling center and all that. And so I, you know, that's why I'm using this analogy, but oftentimes, you know, when I would, we would be doing a survey, we'd be like, you know, do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, some strongly disagree. Um, and if somebody says something else, that's not one of those options, they end up just going in this other box. And, you know, and it's unfortunate because I'm like, they, they will usually give you a very detailed, <laughs> thoughtful opinion about something, but they refuse to go in the box. And so we just say other, uh, and then frankly, there's not much we can do with them because it's, it is really heterogeneous in that other box. And independents are kind of like that too. They're a heterogeneous group. I mean, the same can be said of the, the party identifiers as well. Um, but, you know, so when you talk about independents as group, there's folks that are really educated, know a lot about politics, have decided they don't like either the party standards. For example, maybe they disagree with the Democrats on half the issues and Republicans on the other half. And so they said, ah, I'm an independent. I can't, I can't affiliate with either of these parties. But there's also a really large group of people that just haven't thought that much about politics. Uh, and that's why they're an independent. <laughs> they said, yeah, sure, moderate, that sounds good. 
um, you know, and then still other, right? And then there's lots of idiosyncratic reasons. I'll never forget in grad school, one of my professors, uh, when we were talking about voting, telling us about her grandmother, who used to like to alternate on a ballot. Uh, she'd vote for half Republicans, half Democrats. She wanted to keep it even, Stephen. <laughs> And so it's like, okay, well, if we're trying to figure out why she's voting, you know, the way she is, like, we're screwed. Uh, it's just random at this point, you know, other than she wants to keep a balance. So, you know, so it's it's easy, I think, for us to sort of overstate uh, and talk about these groups and make it sound like they are homogenous, but there is a lot of variation um, in there. Um, I don't know that that actually addressed your, your question, <laughs> other than just me thinking about independence. <laughs> So, so, so thank you. The, the other thing that I wanted to, you know, add to, to what Katie was saying is that uh, I think, Tim, you're right. The, the fact that a lot of people do not uh, take part in, in, in the primaries is an issue because you basically don't give yourself the choice to pick the candidates that you would like best. And that's why you end up with, you know, choices that you don't like. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, prophecy, right? Uh, I don't participate in primaries, uh, therefore, and I have absolutely no influence about the candidate who is going to be chosen. Uh, I'm going to leave that to other people who are probably more motivated than me, uh, more political than me, and, and they're going to make the choice for me. And then when it comes to the time of the general election, then I have to choose between two people that I don't like. And therefore, because I don't like any of these two people and they are, you know, they represent, you know, where they, the partisanship and they represent parties that I don't like, then I don't like either party. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to declare myself as an independent and not take part in, in the process again. And it's just like, you know, it's, a, it's this vicious circle. It, it, Honestly, I, I really, uh, so, of course, you know, it's a problem. Uh, I have no idea how to fix that, to be honest. Um, I, uh, I mean, yes, I, I do have, I do have some ideas on how, on how to fix this. Uh, but, uh, but it's the same thing that, you know, the, when people argue about the two party system, uh, you know, it's, you can, you know, be mad about the fact that we have two major party all you want and say that every day, the only way you're really going to change it is by changing the electoral system. That's really the, the only thing to do. So hopefully this isn't too far afield, but when I talk to my friends on topics like this, we talk about what things could we fix? Mm -hmm. And you know, first of all, gerrymandering, redistricting is huge. So Katie, thank you for sending the link to us. And I'm an IT guy, so I like taking data and making information, but gerrymandering and redistricting is something hopefully we could find a way to fix. Campaign finance reform, Citizens United is not good for the country. And then career politicians, our forefathers, I don't think ever imagined automatic weapons and career politicians. But would, it would take like a constitutional convention to change a lot of that stuff. Is that correct? How could people like us who care get involved in any of those things short of running for office, which I did one time. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, again, we're looking for, you know, somebody to say, Yes, we can have a bipartisan, somewhat objective way to district our communities so that people aren't guaranteed to win based on the numbers that are set up. So again, I could talk about that forever, but are there things that people like us could do in those spaces to make a difference? Uh, so actually my frustration with having repeated conversations about political problems and then students just being like, it is what it is. Uh, I mean, not specifically the students acting that way, but um, just just those experiences was part of what drove me to actually to, to leave academia and to, to try to become more involved in, in fixing things and actually generating, affecting change. Um, 
I can certainly speak on the redistricting aspect of things. Um, you know, uh, New York, so in most states still, the state legislatures draw the lines, which is really crazy. Uh, in most other countries, uh, they don't let people draw their own districts. <laughs> so there's an obvious uh, terrible incentive there um, to, to protect, you know, job security, essentially incumbent gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering, uh, racial gerrymandering. There's lots of jerry, lots of forms that gerrymandering takes. Um, and New York, for example, passed uh, some constitutional, um, some state constitutional amendments in 2014, I believe it was, cr creating uh, a commission. Uh, but unfortunately, they call it an independent commission, but it's not. It's a politician commission. Essentially, the governor and the state legislative leaders pick who is on that commission. Um, and there's also going to be some language on the ballot in 2020 that makes it easier for the new democratic trifecta to pass maps without uh, opposition uh, by the Republicans. Um, so to me, it's pretty transparent what's happening here. It was sort of a, an optics thing. It makes it look like they're making the process less partisan, uh, but in fact, it is not too much. Um, but there are states that have truly independent commissions uh, places like Arizona, like California, Michigan will be uh, redistricting with an independent commission. There are some drawbacks to this, of course. Um, there are some crazy stories about in these states, the parties recruiting individuals to go submit public testimony, pretending to be citizens, just like I just care about redistricting and I just am submitting these proposal maps uh, just, you know, out of the goodness of my heart. Uh, but in fact, they are closely connected with the parties um, and are basically acting on behalf of them. Um, there's a great ProPublica story about California and how essentially the Democrats sort of weaseled their way around the independent commission uh, by sending people uh, in exactly this fashion. Um, and also the fact that California prohibits the commission to look at incumbent addresses and effectively blinded them to the ability to identify that incumbent gerrymandering was occurring because everybody else uh, had access to the data, not the commission. So there, so I think there are like very definitely, like an independent commission is better than a politician commission. A politician commission is better than the state legislature. Uh, there are certain things in terms of the process and the criteria that can improve it um, over, over not. So I think there's very clear um, ways to make reforms there. Um, you know, we have we have a set of priority states that we're keeping our eye on, and a lot of them are states like Mississippi, Louisiana, with a history of racial gerrymandering that are no longer covered by the Voting Rights Act, and their state legislatures still draw the lines. And and it's they have public hearings, but it's it's all for show. It's basically like two days. They had the hearings across the state all at the same time, and then they put the data somewhere in a, in a folder and never look at it again. And then they say, here are the maps we made. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so I think there are concrete reforms in terms of redistricting. The money in politics is, is very challenging uh, for the same reason that uh, if you wanted to enact any sort of gun reform, it's challenging um, just because, you know, uh, in, in the gun situation, it's really a state issue. Um, and, we have the Second Amendment, and uh, even when you, even when assault weapons were banned in the 1990s, they grandfathered in all the existing assault weapons. It just banned the sale of new assault weapons. And I'm pretty sure at this point we have more guns than people in this country. Mm. Um, so <laughs> I feel like the ship has sailed on that one uh, because we can't we can't force people to give back their guns. Um, we could certainly, for example, I mean, I think the Colorado shooting is uh, shaping up to be a, an excellent case for folks who want to enact stricter gun control and say, like, look, like this guy literally just went out and bought the gun, like, you know, a week before he went and did this horrible thing. And a judge had actually halted the order that would have potentially, you know, prevented him from buying this gun. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a very clear case for folks. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like there's... <laughs> You know, you have to get states moving on this, uh, not the federal government. Um, and same thing with the money. It's a constitutional issue. The Supreme Court has ruled that money is, a, is free speech. Um, and so unless you get a constitutional amendment or you get a Supreme Court that's willing to overturn that precedent, I don't know what you do about the money situation. <laughs> So, so good answer, Katie. Just one other thing kind of somewhat related to this. I mean, the national media has such an impact on the populace and local media, whether it's the local newspapers and stuff, 
have such smaller footprints nowadays. But one of the things that I found that's kind of reinvigorating, every morning now I read Heather Cox Richardson's column. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, she's a professor at Boston College, she's a historian. And she take, has taken upon herself to do the first 100 days of Biden's administration. And she kind of aggregates and synthesizes information and puts a historical perspective on it. And now she has a huge following. If you if you're you have to be familiar with you have to have heard the name, but I mean it's kind of a great way to get information. You haven't heard of Heather Cox Richardson? I'm googling her right now. Sebastian, have you heard of her? I, I I think somebody mentioned her to me, but I don't know. In, I don't remember in what context. That's so. Amazing. Please look up the name, and you can, you know, whether it's on Facebook or. What's the name of that, uh, where you can publish it? Not Reddit, it uh, starts with an S, uh, not Slack. Um, uh, yeah. I can't remember that, but just look up Heather. But again, she kind of shares information with a historical perspective. And again, so many things get lost on Fox and CN MSNBC and the like. And you know, people just listen to over and over again, the national media, if we could find outlets like this that could give us a fresh perspective, especially with the historical perspective. Mm. You know, I share it with my kids and my friends because it's like, here, here's something that's not, they're not yelling at your face, in your mm. face. Well, so, so Tim, I, I completely agree with you. The, the problem is that these, this type of media exists. I mean, I, I don't want to state the obvious, but you know, there's PBS uh, and NPR, publicly funded radio, where you, and, and actually it has changed a little bit because now they they have, in order to survive, they have to have, uh, you know, money coming from foundations that are uh, sometimes linked to uh, industrial groups and things like this. But uh, that's the idea behind having a, a media that is independent from uh, both, you know, uh, ideological forces and and and, and money uh, and you know but the problem again is is how do you get people to get engaged with this type of information I think that you find this column particularly uh, enlightening and, and and useful uh, but I would bet that if I were to you know have uh, an average person read that column, they might be very much less interested in it than you are. Uh, I, I'm always surprised when I ask my students, who among you has ever watched the news hour, for example? Um, okay. None of them do. Wow. It, it, it's, and it's, uh, and I, I'm not trying to make publicity for the news hour, but, but when you compare it to other type of news, it, it, there's a reason why it's called the news hour. Last an hour, you have time to develop the information to, you know, make something that is uh, an issue that is complex, explain the complexity of it you know, in, in more than 30 seconds, um, which is completely impossible. Uh, so, so there are things like this, but again, you know, how do you get people to get engaged with this? It's uh, and I, I don't want to be too pessimistic and 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 say, well, there's you know, you were based on what you were asking first. Like, is there anything we can do? I don't want to, uh, you know, give the answer. Well, there's absolutely nothing you can do. And I, I don't think that's true, but I, I think that it's it is very difficult and it's frustrating and it's challenging because it takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, just talking about. I remember last semester talking to my students about voter fraud and how many times and how much uh, we, we how many times we address the issue, how much time I spent on this to try to explain to them that it was not a systemic problem and, and that you know it was not really an issue in this election. And and even then I'm sure that I may have changed the perception of a few of them, but some of them there, it didn't change. It just, it's just, it's always a work in progress, unfortunately. So, so tell me though, so let's use the example of gerrymandering. It just, it, again, it seems to me that an algorithm, which has to be great, created by a human being could help with these kind of things, right? A computer program. Now, yes, you can put bias into that for sure. 
and, and, and maybe it's just a different kind of bias. But I mean, clearly what's happening now in so many places is guaranteeing one party or the other wins. It seems like people like us could put a spotlight on that or help the process or, you know, show people it's like, you know, when you see a map of a district and it's, you know, it's crazy, you know, and you put some numbers next to it and said, hey, this doesn't represent who we are. You know, it seems like there could be, and, and maybe too idealistic, ways to get that in front of people to say, hey, you know, support this, understand what gerrymandering is, understand that, you know, it's politicians guaranteeing, guaranteeing themselves to some degree that they'll always be the party that gets elected in there. So, sorry, I, I, editorializing. Is there a way that people like us could help with making sense of the data, presenting it back, even in our own communities? So I, um, so I'll just say quickly to uh, our stakeholders, which are, you know, like folks like um, Maldef and, um, mm. Uh, geez, why am I like blanking out on all of our stakeholder groups? Anyway, like lots of really great community-based organizations hate the idea of automated redistricting, like really strong feelings about it. Um, but that would be a, a much longer topic for conversation. Um, it's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, but, you know, I, one of the things that I've really taken away from my time at the Data Hub is that there are, there are good people working on the issue. And for me, what I love about working at the Data Hub is that we are, our focus is on the data, but we're also trying to be a hub and be connected to all of the groups that are working on this. And in fact, I just spoke with a potential volunteer yesterday who effectively said that the main reason why he contacted our organization versus any others to work on redistricting was because he saw all the groups that we were connected with. And he didn't want people to be reinventing the wheel, to be duplicating work. And, and I've heard that same thing just even within uh, sort of like submitting testimony that you have to connect, you have to, you have to meet the people who are working on this and figure out like, what is the ideal map for you guys don't work as individuals. So for me, it's really reinforced the notion that there are, there are good people, there are good groups that are working on this issue. And the key is to start connecting them with each other because it's a power asymmetry at the end of the day, uh, you know, Specifically, in thinking about redistricting, oh, I'm going to have a cat again. Uh, thinking about redistricting, you know, for a long time, they were the ones with the access to the data and the tools, and and the people just didn't have that access, and so there was no way we could compete with their. You know, you want us to draw a legally compliant map when we don't have the data and we don't have the tools? Like that's just not possible. I mean, politicians are working full time <laughs> to keep themselves in power, um, and we are not. We do it on the side for a few hours during the week. So the more this, there's really strength in numbers, um, and I am heartened. You know, I'm not. I'm not so Pollyannish as to think that we're going to defeat and gerrymandering this cycle or even next cycle, but, but I am very heartened by the connections that we're making and the efforts that can be produced when, when groups start to find each other. And in fact, I'll give you one more quick story about this. So another potential volunteer I spoke with uh, this week uh, actually worked in the New York State Legislature for several redistricting cycles, like 1980, 1990, 2000. He was there as a staffer working all of that. Um, and one of the things he said was, you know, what's sad is that out in the community, there are groups that fight with each other when they should be allies, you know, and he named specifically racial groups, but, but you could apply that to many other communities. And I think, unfortunately, that happens a lot of times where, where folks are fighting for each other, like it's a zero sum game, which in redistricting, it kind of is, <laughs> uh, you got to put the line somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, um, I, I really think that that's, that would be my, my number one suggestion would be about like, there, there are people who are working on this issue, go find them. They trust me, they have more work than they can do on their own. Um, and the more that, that groups get connected with each other and people get connected to each other, the stronger, the stronger, the, the people army will be against the politician army uh, mm. effectively. So I'm going to go check out your, the data hub. Yeah. <laughs> you can, and Sebastian could read Heather Cox Richardson 
you know, at least a couple of times, give it a chance, and go back and read her historical perspective on how we got to where we are on guns. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, she takes us all the way back and, you know, how the NRA changed their position. She wrote a marvelous column two or three days ago, right? It was right after the shooting, so it was only two days ago. And I'll look at the data hub. What kind of volunteers do you need? Ooh, uh, here yeah. you go. You I'm gotta... offline about this. We need it's good. <laughs> we need heavy. We need good Googlers right now. We need people who can who can find out information for us. But um, 100, percent I'd be happy to to chat with. But you. It, yeah, and it, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, I saw the the comment from Dorothy in the in in the chat box about being being a. a, a um, uh, ger gerrymandering being a partisan issue it's it's I mean it's true and and so uh, and and neither party has uh, an incentive to change things uh, it is like you know when we're talking about the electoral system right uh, the, the democratic and republican party have an absolutely no incentive to change the, the electoral system because they have nothing to gain from it only is to lose uh, or allow you know more parties to be able to emerge uh and and that's not good for them so so you're to come back to what my colleague kitty was saying the really the the real issue is is the, the you know whether people against uh, against the party and if you can show strength in numbers and, and, and people who are truly connected with each other uh, outside groups uh that that is probably the uh, the best way to, to move forward, mm -hmm. but uh, I, you know, it's let's let's face it. It's not, you know, as Katie said, it's not going to happen this election cycle or in the next. It's going to take time. So, how often do how often does a constitutional convention can that be called? Is that every ten years? I believe in New York they set it up to be every twenty. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's every twenty in New York. Uh, it was but, 2017. Uh, last one and that's a perfect example of the power asymmetry right there the uh -huh. only signs and stickers that i saw were to vote no for the con con uh mm -hmm. but there are a t but that was politicians just being like oh like what a disaster that would be like let's <laughs> spend a little bit of money and people who haven't thought much about this issue like great you know uh, but there was no organization. Uh, there was probably lots and lots of people who were like, yes, uh, we should do this. But there was just no organization. There was no uh, advertising. Yeah. And, and it's it also, sorry, Katie. No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say there's, uh, you know, um, and, and I see that at the, at the national level and something that always strikes me uh being from a from a different country uh, especially a country where we had you know lots and lots of different constitutions uh the 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 us is very attached to obviously the the us constitution but i think that translates to to uh the rules of politics in general it's very very difficult uh, uh for americans to believe that you can change the rules and that it's okay. But it, it, it's, there's a, some, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly where it comes from, but there's it, really something cultural there about, uh, about how, you know, you were, even Tim, you were, you know, you were, you were mentioning that historian and this historic, you know, uh, historical perspective. Uh, I think Americans are very attached to the history that they have, and therefore, uh, it, it's it's so present. You know, you you because you have a young history, you're very attached to it much more than countries that have had, you know, many many more uh, centuries uh, of existence where where change has happened and, and, and changes more regularly and it's okay. And we don't think that it's, uh, it, it means that we don't have uh, a love or for our country, but that's how a lot of Americans, I think, express their love for the nation is through, uh, through this, you know, reverence for, uh, for the, the constitutions and, and the way the rules were on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, America is super weird, actually. Like, <laughs> I feel like that's why I live here. It's interesting. <laughs> it's <really> unique. <laughs> More, yes, yeah. we are exceptional, but not necessarily for the reasons people <laughs> think. <laughs> but we are such an outlier in some regards. Um, <laughs> really interesting <laughs> i don't know if we have any more uh, comments or questions so some very um yeah. yeah well thank you katie and sebastian for a very thoughtful discussion it's really and for everybody participating as i mentioned at the beginning we will have a recording that will be sent out it might take about a week but i will be sure that everybody who's in here um you know gets it and then you could um give that information to other people as well and, and, and maybe Katie, we can have another program again, too. I know you always seem to have a, such interesting discussion. So we'll get the professors back again. Could you please also share any links? Uh, Katie and I had a little conversation about the, the Sunshine Week. And I didn't, haven't seen much in the newspaper at all about it. And again, the Sunlight Foundation, you know, oh, okay. you know, Again, if there are organizations, especially in New York State, that are trying to do those kind of things, that'd be good information to share around. Sure. If you wanted to put anything in the chat, the chat will be saved too. That would be going to you. So okay. I don't know if Katie or Sebastian has that too, or Tim, if you, yeah, that would, would but the chat would be included in the recording. Yeah. And I was also going to say, um, Tim, that unfortunately, uh, not New York State, but New York mm -hmm. City does have. I think are really excellent open data program. Oh, that's good. Uh, that's like pretty user friendly. Have you read the book Citizen Bill? No, I have not. Gavin Newsom. Okay. He, oh, seriously, that. read the book Citizenville from Gavin Newsom before he was Lieutenant Governor. He was the mayor of uh, San Francisco and love him or hate him. But his book talks about all of that and it has a bunch of technologists that contribute to the to the conversation. So I've given it to a couple of politicians. And again, it's it, it put the data out there so people can make sense of it, whether it's parking places or budget data or crime information, all of that is kind of the, the pillars of that talking in that book. Are you looking for it now? Yeah, yeah, I just pulled it up. You, yeah, you guys should read that. It's, I mean, I've had three copies and given away two of them. And, and it's exactly what you were talking about. Again, open government, true data, making sense of it all so that, again, people like me, you know, who, you know, can live in a world of a spreadsheet and make sense of data. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just the way we should be taking advantage of technology looking forward. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So Heather Cox Richardson, please. Your homework is to read we a couple. Have more, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Citizenville, I think it'd be worth your time. You'd, I think it'd be good to read. Yeah. I can see if we own it in the library. We probably, probably my colleague would buy it if we don't. So there's only one in Monroe County, I think. Okay, is it not Penfield? I don't think, but no, I'll tell oh, my right colleague. Headed, I believe because yeah, okay, yeah, no, I bet my colleague at Penfield. Yeah, Gavin about. Newsom, and I think it was okay. 2013. Okay, if it's available, yeah, I asked her to sure. But the whole thing yeah, about it's 2013, you're right. Available is cool. Okay. It's really great. well thought out and presented. Okay, thanks, Tim. That's great. Yeah, thanks for the recommendation. Mm hmm. I'm gonna to have to read it after this town though, which is a 2014 book about uh, just like all the creepy, horrible connections in DC and how they all just like know each other and give each other. I money. have, so who wrote that? Um, I have that, I, um, the bald headed guy. Um, hmm. I can't remember his Carville? name. Excuse me? Carville? No. James oh, James Carville? Yeah. No. No, 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 no. no, no. So, um, bold, yeah. This town, yes. It's kind of a satire, isn't it? Mm. Well, I haven't read it yet, so that's why. <laughs> so I actually have that book. Yeah. Um, huh. Holy cow. Uh, Wikip anyway, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking it up now, but. Well, um, I'll have to check that one too for us. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, sorry, I'm rambling out. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Sebastian and Katie. Yeah, thanks to you. Thank you very much for- uh, Thank you everyone you. too. Thank you for all your contributions yeah. and we'll get that recording out and then we'll uh, see if we can plan another discussion again.